Thank you very much, and the committee shall come to order. We are meeting today to consider th 13 pieces of legislation. All have been properly noticed and circulated electronically along with copies of timely filed amendments and will be available at the committee repository at docs.house.gov. Late amendments are also circulated electronically. Pursuant to committee rules, members of the committee may submit written opening statements for the record. I ask that members may revise and extend the remarks on, on the bills to be considered at this markup and have those remarks included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Pursuant to committee rule 3I and House Rules 11 Clause 2, I announce that I may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote or the A's and nays are ordered. Documents and amendments or motions was submitted to hnrc.docs email from a house maintained email address. Please note that members are responsible for their own microphones. Members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. I strongly recommend that members joining remotely use the grid view and lock their timer to a location so it remains visible. Members experiencing technical problems should immediately inform uh, committee staff. The item for consideration is HR 263 offered by Representative Quigley. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife be discharged from further consideration. Without objection, the bill will be, the bill will be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. I now recognize the Chair of the Subcommittee, Representative Huffman, to speak on the legislation. Mr. Huffman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Chair, it's uh, unknown how many big cats, including tigers, lions, jaguars, leopards, cougars, and hybrids, are currently kept in private ownership in the United States, but estimates go as high as 20,000. Privately owned big cats are often purchased or bred as cubs for photo ops, and as they grow larger, they're sold into the exotic pet trade or on the black market for wildlife parts. Adult big cats in private ownership typically live in inadequate conditions that are often inhumane for wildlife and unsafe for the public. Since 1990, around 300 dangerous incidents involving big cats in the United States have resulted in human injuries, mauling, and death. In many cases, the animals are shot and killed. First responders are not equipped for these situations. This loss of life is senseless and entirely avoidable. In 2003, Congress unanimously passed the Captive Wildlife Safety Act, which amended the Lacey Act to prohibit the import, export, buying, selling, transport, receiving, or acquisition of big cats across states and the United States borders. Though our state laws vary, there is no federal policy regarding the possession of big cats. H.R. 263, the Big Cat Public Safety Act, would end the ownership of big cats as pets and prohibit uh, exhibitors from allowing public contact with big cats, including cubs and this practice of cub petting. Cub petting is not only dangerous, but it perpetuates the cycle of breeding in captivity and the trade in big cats. This bill focuses narrowly on privately owned animals. It includes exemptions for exhibitors uh, who exhibit with the United States Department of Agriculture Class C license and also current owners are grandfathered in as long as they register with the Fish and Wildlife Service and abide by listed regulations. So as the TV series Tiger King revealed, there is a dark, dangerous side of keeping lions, tigers, and other big cats in captivity. The Big Cat Public Safety Act is a common sense solution to address public safety and animal abuse concerns uh, and it has passed the House under suspension in the last Congress. So uh, I commend my colleague, Mr. Quigley, for his leadership, his good work on this bill, and I urge members to vote yes. Yield back. Is there any further debate before we begin uh, the amendment process? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, with the committee not having met to mark up legislation in more than two months, 
I'd hoped we'd be coming back today to consider bills to lower skyrocketing energy costs, addressing drought in the West, mitigating catastrophic wildfires, or maybe bringing immediate relief to any of the other myriad crises plaguing our country and impacting millions of Americans. That's why when I saw the big ticket item on today's agenda was a bill to regulate big cat ownership, I wondered, maybe we should stop streaming our subscription services and turn on the local news broadcast. Perhaps all the remote proceedings, virtual votes, and legislating via Zoom have confused the Democrat majority into thinking it's still early 2020 and Americans are still locked at home watching Tiger King on Netflix. Mr. Chair, what is on Americans' minds today is not their Netflix watch list. Americans are not talking about tigers. They're feeling their budgets get tighter. As gasoline prices have skyrocketed to a record national average, a record national average of $4.91 per gallon, a price that many on the left seem to embrace and think it should go higher. Meanwhile, Though we should be expanding production of American energy here at home, our constituents are watching President Biden call on Iran and Venezuela for oil and natural gas and lift tariffs on solar panels constructed by slave labor overseas, a major giveaway to China's state-subsidized companies and the Chinese Communist Party. It's further exporting American wealth to China at the expense of American workers and taxpayers. They're not concerned about lions. They're seeing the lions grow at their local food bank. President Biden's inflation, energy and supply chain crises are all converging to drive up the cost of basic necessities for American families, leaving many with the sad realization that their once comfortable paycheck now does not have the purchasing power to put food on their family's table. Wildfires. Not wild cats have ravaged nearly 2 million acres of land in the United States this year to date. A recent study by the First Street Foundation found at least 10 million properties in the United States are facing major to extreme wildfire risk. We should be debating how to capture snow melt, not snow leopards, to make our Western communities more resilient against drought. This committee has the ability to advance the kinds of legislation to improve our water infrastructure, produce clean, efficient, and carbon-free hydroelectricity, and bring reliable, affordable, high-quality water to farmers and families alike. Unfortunately, while Republicans have introduced numerous bills that will lower gas prices, promote American energy independence, increase water supplies, and reduce the threat of catastrophic wildfires, committee Democrats have refused to give these bills any of the necessary hearings or markups to advance them through the legislative process. Mr. Chair, today my colleagues and I intend to offer several amendments to bring the committee back on the right track, advancing real solutions to address the crises facing our nation. I urge my Democrat colleagues to do something exotic and join me in supporting these Republican amendments. By working together, we can bask in the sense of accomplishment that comes with advancing the kinds of bold solutions our constituents sent us here to take on. That being said, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to I'd be remiss if I didn't or remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there are several bills on the agenda today that are the kind of bipartisan solutions we all want to see Congress advance. We are going to offer uh, many amendments on the big cat bill. Um, this bill is something that should easily be passed through the committee if uh, if the majority would accept the common sense amendments that we've offered. Uh, but really, there are more important things to our country today than, uh, and they're on the mind of the American people, than uh, a bill based on a streaming show. So with that, I oppose the bill. We'll be offering amendments, and I yield back. Gentlemen, anyone else wish to be recognized? Mr. Chair. I think so. Who, who seeks recognition? Sir? Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, inflation is at an all-time high and shows no sign of slowing down. Gas continues to skyrocket. Families can't find formula on shelves for their newborn children. Every American's purchasing power is diminished. Blackouts are going to haunt Americans from coast to coast through the hot summer. 
The alarming number of illegal immigrants pouring over our southern and northern border, smuggling drugs into our communities, and plotting terrorist attacks is now routine. And this committee has so much jurisdiction to tackle issues relevant to Americans. We can pass legislation to restart onshore and offshore leasing and lower gas prices. We can cut our supply chain deficits by accessing domestic critical minerals. We can streamline responsible development projects so we can strengthen our grid. And we can create good paying jobs so Americans can have more money in their pockets. Our, eco our economy is crumbling. So instead of talking about cats today, I urge my Democrat colleagues to instead take up legislation under excuse me, under this committee's jurisdiction that will actually help Americans. So let's not sit idly by while our neighbors watch their savings dwindle and their kids ask why they can't afford to play Little League this summer or why they don't have air conditioning for days at a time or why they can't make that 4th of July road trip uh, to go camping. And again, why are we paying $5 a gallon for gas? We can use our time better to help America get back on its feet. Mr. Chair, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Anyone, anyone, uh, anyone else seek uh, recognition? Without objection, uh, the ANS offered by myself is considered as read and open to am amendment at any point. Ranking Member Westerman, you have a substitute to chair's amendment in the nature of substitute. And that, and I reserve a point of order on the substitute. We, we have ranking members recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do support the intent of this bill, but I have concerns with the way the bill is written. As I said in my opening statement, I believe this bill is duplicative of existing agency jurisdiction. Historically, this matter has been under the purview of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, which is housed at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and is therefore under the jurisdiction of the House Committee on Agriculture. This bill ignores jurisdictional lines because, as a few bill supporters have told my staff, they don't want to work with the Agriculture Committees and would rather use the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under the Lacey Act to create new regulation, even they admit would overlay current federal agency jurisdiction and regulations. This is not the only bill that proposes new regulation. We have another bill this Congress that seeks to regulate monkeys under the moniker of the Lacey Act. If the goal of this legislation is to address public safety and the humane treatment of big cats, and I believe the appropriate legislative solution is, sending, is amending the Animal Welfare Act by working with the Agriculture Committee. Over the past year, I've had multiple meetings with supporters of H.R. 263. Many of them point to U.S. Department of Agriculture or USDA licensed facilities that allow cub petting as one of the main issues they're trying to solve. My amendment addresses those concerns by changing the USDA licensing requirements to prohibit activities such as cub petting. This amendment uses the same language we are considering today to amend the Animal Welfare Act instead of the Lacey Act, which focuses on wildlife trafficking at both an international and interstate level. It also addresses the pet ownership concern often raised without overriding states' laws. My amendment would require that individuals in states where big cat ownership is allowed must register the animals with USDA. This amendment would not supersede any current or future state laws regarding big cats. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. USD already has inspectors and law enforcement officers that are well-versed in animal welfare issues. If we truly want to solve this issue, it would be better solved through the Animal Welfare Act and not the Lacey Act. I also ask my colleagues to support this amendment and I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, let me recognize myself. Uh, 
Mr. Ranking Member, for reasons of the committee's jurisdiction, I reserved a point of order on the substitute amendment uh, and ask it that if you're willing to uh, withdraw the amendment at this time. Mr. Chair, the, the uh, House parliamentarians hold that the inverse is also true. If an amendment has even a uh, scintilla of jurisdiction of the committee considering it, the amendment passes uh, the rules muster. Uh, my amendment addresses the Lacey Act, uh, the act that H.R. 263 proposes to modify by duplicating authorities already at the USDA. This amendment does also address the Animal Welfare Act, which is under the Committee on Agriculture's jurisdiction. That is where care for big cats as pets properly belongs, since the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, is responsible for animal health and welfare. However, for the advice of the uh, parliamentarians, because this amendment does also contain our committee's jurisdiction, a Rule 10 appointment of order should not be sustained. Well, let me continue to rec let me recognize myself. First, let me say that I, I believe the amendment exceeds the committee's jurisdiction under Rule 10 and is subject to being ruled out of order. We have examined the substitute motion and the ANS and have consulted with the Office of the Parliamentary House Parliamentarian. Portions of the substitute fall under the jurisdiction of the Committee of Ag on Agriculture and, under, and other under the jurisdiction of the Committee on the Budget. This committee cannot legislate outside our jurisdiction under House rules. That's why I believe that, uh, and would rule that the, that, the, that the amendment is out of order. Now, in the interest of not dragging all our colleagues into the room for a live procedural vote, I'm waiving my point of order and will dispense with the amendment during the roll votes, uh, roll vote series instead. Uh, I'd like to say that 52 Republican uh, colleagues are co-sponsors of the legislation, and that we heard testimony, uh, pervasive testimony from Sheriff Lutz and others relative to the danger and uh, the necessity uh, for the legislation. Uh, as, as it was testified, the Big Cat Public Safety Act represents a critical opportunity to protect first responders, the public, and the animals themselves, and I hope you all will support uh, me and voting for the bill today, and I yield back. Any further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chair, did you withdraw your point of yes, order? Yes, I did. I did that right at the beginning. All right. Uh, hearing no further debate, there's a question on the substitute amendment. I will pause now so that uh, members join us remotely can unmute. All those in favor of the substitute amendment, Mr. Westerman, will vote aye. All those opposed will say no. And then, uh, in the opinion, all those in favor of the amendment, please aye. indicate aye. 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 All those opposed? No. No. Oh. Oh. In the opinion of the chair of the no's habit, the amendment is not agreed to. It I request a recorded vote. A yeah, recorded vote has been requested, and the vote will be postponed pursuant to prior announcement. We now have uh, Representative Graves. You have an amendment designated number two, and you are recognized for five minutes. The inquire of the ranking members, Ms. I don't I don't see Representative Graves in the room or on the no. on the Zoom. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Which was next? Yeah, he's he will he will be here shortly if you want to move to another amendment. Let me now uh, call up uh, Representative Carl. You have an amendment designated number one, and you are recognized for five minutes. Representative 
Representative Carl. Uh, let me uh, let me inquire the ranking member. There's uh, dozens of amendments, uh, a dozen amendments at least on this particular piece of legislation. If the member is not present to 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 present his amendment, is is somebody going to do so in their stead? I, I can keep going down till we run into people that are here, but at this point, you know. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we can, uh, I know Representative Bobert's here and she has amendments. Okay. Representative Bentz is here. We'll go, uh, we'll go in that direction. All right. Uh, Representative Bobert, you have an amendment. It's designated as number one and uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is um, my amendment 279 that we're discussing. Um, it issues a sense of Congress that expending taxpayer resources to talk about big cats in lieu of tackling mm -hmm. inflation is both a dereliction of duty and morally reprehensible. Uh, for the year ending uh, April 2022, prices for food at home increased by 10.8%. That's the largest increase since November 1980, before I was even born. Prices for food away from home increased by 7.2% over the same period, the highest increase since November 1981. The Consumer Price Index, CPI, rose by 0.3% for all items in April, equaling an 8.3 rise year over year. It's clear that under the Biden price hike, no American is safe. Everything from shelter to food to airfare has increased under this regime. Americans are paying the price for bad policy. In late March, Bloomberg Economics argued that inflation was costing the average American family approximately $5,200 a year. Real wages have also decreased by over 3% since the Biden regime took power. So much for the president's promises not to raise taxes on anyone making under $400,000 a year. Inflation is what happens when the federal government spends nearly $7 trillion in one year, as is what happened in 2021. Spending in 2022 is also expected to approach that amount. The American people also shouldn't forget that if this administration had its way, we'd have spent another $3.5 trillion on the China-centric green energy lobby endorsed Build Back Better agenda. Nothing's built, nothing's back, nothing's better. Really, I wish that the people in power would have just left things alone the way they were and we would all be okay. We'd also be diverting millions of taxpayer dollars in service of tree equity. Despite the clear threat that inflation poses to the future, of our country and to the pocketbooks of hardworking American families, the Democrat Party is choosing to instead debate whether or not to impose additional restrictions on big cat ownerships. Carol Baskin would be shaking her head. Aren't you glad that the so-called adults are back in charge? Can, you, can the other side assure Republicans on this committee that after we regulate big cats, we can finally tackle inflation in our capacities as elected representatives. This Democrat majority will do everything and anything to, defl to deflect, blame their significant role in perpetuating our national inflation crisis, understanding that it's still so important to bring up the topic of inflation. And to, in uh, to add insult to injury, millions of Americans were promised that inflation was a temporary problem. Last year, several cabinet, cabinet members, including Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, argued that expansionary fiscal policy of the Biden regime, which is a polite way to describe the Democrats' wild spending spree, was simply temporary. Republicans on this committee and in the House are ready to take immediate action 
to fight this crisis. It is clear, given the committee's majority priorities here today, they are not. With that, I argue adoption of my amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields. Any, any other further discussion on the amendment? Bobert 279, I believe. Number one? Are we on number one? You told me to. Anyone else wish to comment on that? Mr. Huffman. Mr. Chairman, this amendment was filed late after the committee deadline, so I appreciate uh, the representative's uh, remarks, but uh, members, our staff, uh, the affected agencies and the executive branch, affected stakeholders, none of them have had uh, any opportunity to review and comment on this amendment, so I strongly urge members to oppose it. Any further discussion on the amendment? Anyone else seek to be recognized? Hearing no further debate, the question is on Bobert Amendment Number One. I will pause so the members joined remotely can unmute. All those in favor of the amendment indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed to the amendment indicate by saying no. 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 In the opinion of Chair, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. May I request the yeas and nays? A recorded vote has been requested. The vote will be postponed prior to my prior announcement. Uh, we now move. Uh, Now call uh, on Representative Graves. You have an amendment designated uh, number two, and you're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, in episode of episode five of, of Joe versus Carol that I've never watched in my life, um, the candidate for, excuse me, the, the, the actor for Carol Baskin is quoted as saying, this is starting to get a little woo-hoo. And I think her point is that, is that it, it's crazy, it's insane what's happening right now. Um, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're in a situation where uh, we're in the committee with jurisdiction over energy. This committee has jurisdiction over natural resources. And we are sitting here in this committee and, and we're dealing with a truth commission, we're dealing with land transfers, we're, we're dealing with, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 I'll put it this way. There's not a single constituent in, in, in the months and months and months that, that we've been traveling around our district that has said, I want you to do a single one of these bills. Not, not a single constituent. Mr. Chairman, the President of the United States is gonna get on an airplane, get on Air Force One with all the emissions, and he's gonna travel 13 hours and 40 minutes. He's gonna travel 6,736 miles to go to Saudi Arabia to go negotiate oil coming from Saudi Arabia to the United States to help bring down the absurd energy prices that Ranking Member Westerman brought up before. Now, being the environmentally conscious person that I am, not to mention representing, I don't know, the United States, We've, we've calculated some closer places he could go where you can find energy. And by the way, this employs Americans and puts money in our pockets rather than in, in the Saudi Arabia. You can come down to my home state. I do it every week. It's about 1,000 miles. You can go to California, where I'm sure Mr. Huffman would love to have you all come. Nearly less than 2,500 miles. They have energy there. You can go to North Dakota. You, you can go to Ohio, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma. I was in the Permian last week. You've got energy all over the place, and, and, and thank you, thank you. Um, they're, they're being invited to, to Colorado as well. That's right, y'all have energy in Montana. Now look, 
These are, these are various, these are various reports. The President of the United States is going to go to Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned. He's going to go to Venezuela. He's going to go to Iran. And, and of course, the, the White House says that OPEC action is not enough. We're going, to get, we're going to get the Federal Trade Commission involved as well. Look, Mr. Chairman, this isn't rocket science. We had low energy prices, and let me reiterate to those of you that care about the environment, and we had lower emissions. We had lower emissions. Get the Senate letter, Senate letter. We had lower emissions under the previous administration. Low prices and lower emissions. Now, roll your eyes, call me out on it, fact check it, I dare you. This president has resulted in higher emissions, unaffordable energy prices, and energy security that's a complete disaster. The Senate letter, they don't have it? Okay. This is, this is January 27th of last year. Look, you, you've said several times before, I'm not the smartest person in this body or in this committee, and I agree with you, I'm not, I'm not. Yep, January 27th of last year, this is what we posted. We're gonna result in higher, last year, January of last year, higher electricity prices, higher prices of gas pump, lost revenue sharing for hurricane protection, coastal restoration, higher delivery costs passed on to consumers, more dependence on foreign energy, a net increase in global emissions. I'll say it again, when, and you remind me usually at each markup, I'm not the smartest person in this room, but I could look at this administration's policies and tell where we were going. This is a complete disaster, that one. Here's one of our constituents, sent this to us, totally unprompted. I'm on fixed income, my wife works full time. It's gotten so bad with gas prices, it's almost not worth my wife working. We're struggling to make our bills because everything is so high. Can you please fight as hard as you can to lower gas prices, especially with our state being an oil and gas state? Your constituents are hurting. This is David from Denham Springs, Louisiana. Mr. Chairman, what in the world are we doing? What in the world are we doing in this committee? Sitting here, spending time doing this kind of stuff. This is a complete, complete waste of time in regard to the true priorities, the true priorities of Americans across the country. But I'll tell you what, Mr. Chairman, don't, don't take my word for it. Here's a Democrat congressman from California. Voters are beyond furious. It's called desperation. I don't hear anything about other national issues we're focusing on in Washington. The thing I hear about is gasoline. What are you doing to bring down the gas prices? This is trashing our economy. It's trashing our country. Therefore, amendment number two is an amendment that helps to ensure that gas prices come down. I urge adoption of the amendment yield back. Gentleman yields back. Anyone else? Uh, anyone else, uh, any committee member wish to be heard on uh, Mr. Graves' amendment number two? Hearing no further debate, the question is on the Graves amendment number two. I will pause so the members uh, can unmute. All those in favor of the amendment Graves number two, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed to Graves amendment number two, indicate by saying no. 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 The opinion of the chair of the no's have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Graves? Uh, request a recorded vote. Gentlemen, request a recorded vote, uh, and the vote will be postponed pursuant to uh, prior announcement. Representative Graves, you now, uh, you have amendment designated number three, and you're recognized for five minutes. Let's go back through. So here's some other ones. Um, this, is our, uh, this is our hometown paper at the top. Thanks to the rising price of natural gas and the summer heat, electric bills for Louisiana residents and businesses are expected, are set to shoot up drastically. So, so Mr. Chairman, natural gas prices, as I recall, and I apologize, don't remember the latest number, uh, but I believe they've gone up about 300% since President Biden took office, 300%. The majority of our electricity comes from natural gas fired power plants, and so therefore, uh, you, you're gonna see a little bit of a lag in electricity prices because most often you have long-term contracts on natural gas. But as these contracts are renewed and the new prices are locked in, you are gonna see skyrocketing electricity prices. So, so ladies and gentlemen, it is not limited, it is not limited to just gasoline and diesel. It, it, it is gonna be electricity prices and they're coming. You're gonna see doubling and tripling of electricity prices. Uh, 
One of our local TV stations, the cost of gas reached record, low, record highs in Louisiana. In March, it's only gotten worse. The price per gallon varies by 10 cents or more across capital, depending on the gas station. One of our HOMA newspaper, industry officials say jobs, economy, and tax revenue at state if Biden delays oil leases. The first president in modern history to not have lease sales. I had a conversation with the Secretary of Energy who came down to Louisiana recently, which I will tell you, I very much appreciate her coming to visit, and I appreciate her giving me time to talk. But my conversation with her, she says, I'm talking to her about leases, the fact that we need to offer up leases, new production areas. I don't know, how about in the United States versus Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela, or other countries? You know what her response was? We don't need new sources of energy. Okay, let me ask you a question, Mr. Chairman. How is it that you don't need new sources of energy when our own president is going to Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and others, and our own president is releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? that's supposed to be for disasters, not disastrous policies. <laughs> Help me understand how you don't need new supply whenever you're tapping foreign supplies and tapping our emergency reserves, putting us in a precarious or a dangerous situation. How can those two things coexist? Anybody? How can they coexist? This is, this is the stupidest energy policy I've ever seen in my life. And, and I don't care who you are. If you're, if you're a hardcore liberal, you're a hardcore conservative. This is affecting every American. It's undermining our economy. We have the resources right here in the United States. Why aren't we producing it? This is absolutely idiotic, these policies that we're moving forward on. There was a Treasury official under the Biden administration who was quoted as saying it was their objective to raise energy prices. Give the star one. It was their objective to raise energy prices. He, he said it. He said this is their intent, is to raise energy prices. It was their very objective. Let me tell you something. Boy, does that guy get a star. Congratulations. Congratulations, you achieved it. The highest energy prices that we've seen. The highest energy prices. Every single day, prices going up. I mean, who, who in the world are we representing? I thought we were sent here and we raised our hands and we took an oath to the, to the Constitution of the United States and the citizens that we represent. Let me tell you who's benefiting from what's going on right now. Iran, China, Russia, Venezuela, OPEC plus nations. Not us, we're paying for it. We're paying for it. And there was nobody, there was nobody who couldn't have looked at this and recognized exactly where this was going. And as I said, January 27th, last year, we posted this on Facebook. January 27th of last year, every single thing we've said was going to happen has happened. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to say this again. You failed the test of affordability. You failed the test of protecting the environment. And you failed the test on energy security. Have we not learned our lesson that by, by, by putting all of our eggs in the basket of people like Vladimir Putin, what a disaster that can be? Yet under this administration, when our Secretary of Interior sat right there and I asked her how much oil we bring in from Russia, she said, I have no idea. When we went through and explained that we had nearly tripled our importation or our dependence on Russian oil under that administration, under the Biden administration, she apparently had no clue and not understanding that by stopping domestic energy production, you have no impact on demand. All you do is cause prices to go up. So vote for amendment number three. Yield back. Any further discussion in the amendment? Mr. Chairman. You'll recognize, sir. Thank you. And, and uh, Representative Graves, could, uh, could I just uh, ask you to amplify on one issue you touched on, but I'd like a little bit more clarification, and I'll yield to you in a second. What is the environmental difference between energy produced in the United States versus a Russia or Venezuela or Nigeria or some of these other countries? Now yield to the member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lamborn. Uh, Mr. Lamborn, uh, the National Energy Technology Lab, which is uh, some of the premier scientists in regard to energy technology and energy production, uh, they have uh, done a, a, an extensive report, if I, were, if I remember correctly, it was in October, September, October of 2019, where they found that Russian natural gas delivered to Europe, delivered, which as you know, I think Germany has over 60% dependence on Russian gas, has a 41% higher life cycle cost excuse me, higher life cycle emissions. 41% higher life cycle emissions than U.S. gas delivered, and I'm talking about natural gas, delivered to Europe. If you, if you look at Asia, 
the comparison is it's actually 47% higher life cycle emissions from Asian, from, from Russian gas being delivered to Asia as compared to U.S. gas. Look, the Biden administration, Mr. Lamborn, I know you know this, the Biden administration has said that under the EIA projections under the Biden administration, developing countries are gonna see a growth in demand for natural gas between 31 and I think it's 44% over the next 28 years. Developed, developing countries are gonna see an increase in demand between 44, no, 51 and 88%, between 51. So look, the Biden administration acknowledges we are gonna have a surge in global demand for natural gas. If we produce it cleanest and safest, then my gosh, why aren't we producing it here and sending it other places, which reduces global emissions? Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Anyone else wish to be recognized on uh, the amendment? General ladies recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to respond. I have no prepared comments. I don't have the facts in front of me. But I just want to say to my colleagues, we share your concern about all of these issues. The facts are not as simple as you would make them in these posters. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we are producing a capacity, I understand. The fact of the matter is, is that our oil companies have 9,000, my colleagues will remember the exact number, that are not being used. We, we, have, we all need to work together. I, I don't think we accomplish anything by sitting here and accusing each other. There are many complicated factors. And the war in Ukraine is front and center as one of them. Let's work together on, on trying to do this. And we do need to become less reliant on oil and fossil fuels so it isn't a tool any longer in the global marketplace against us, and you do need to be mo moving towards renewable energy. So I hope we can all work together. I just, I can't sit here all morning and look like this side doesn't give a damn about what's happening. Well, the because we yield? care as much as you do. Yes, I will yield. Thank you. Um, I, I, I appreciate my friend from Michigan. I do truly consider you my friend, and I enjoy the opportunity to work with you. Um, uh, Congresswoman Dingell, in regard to the APDs, the permits, Right now, we have a higher percentage of permits that are under production than ever before. The, 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 this is part of the problem. You have people out there saying things that have no idea what they're talking about, none. We are at the highest percentage of permits under production today. We are seeing some of the slowest permit approvals that we have seen. Uh, and if I recall correctly, and I, I can go back and check it, I think during the Obama administration at this point in time, they had already done like 50 lease sales, and they've done zero. So, so I would love to work with you. I would. I would love I to work to with you. That. And I would love to, to look at the facts on this and see if we can come up with some, some solutions. But doing some of the things we're doing right now is baffling to me when we have a crisis and that I, Americans... And I would go back at you and say to you that the Secretary of Energy has said to us in classified briefings, has said, so I guess I hope I didn't say something wasn't, and has said to us in committee hearings that there is not a permit that has not been issued. There are no pending permits. Now let's not get into, let's just agree to work together and not look, make it look like this side doesn't give a damn because we share that concern and all of us are worried about what the consumer is paying for gasoline right now and it's something that we want to work on and be addressed and we could talk about how our consumers are being price gouged, what the cost of a barrel is, which is at $30, and how, how does the price of gasoline go up 50 some cents in a five day period? There's nothing that happened to impact that, ex you know, I would argue corporate greed, but I will yield back my time. General Lady Yields, anyone else wish to be recognized on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gomer, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, and I know the, my friend from Michigan does care deeply. Um, in East Texas, the place where Ford um, Lee Churchill said the Allies uh, floated to victory in World War II on a pool of East Texas oil, now uh, natural gas is the predominant um, energy source out of East Texas. Uh, but 
it's not being produced the way it could be. Uh, and I've heard from the administration about the greedy oil companies. There is nobody in America who has done more for profits of big oil companies than President Joe Biden. He is making them a fortune because that's what happens when you have less of a product that everybody needs, the prices go up. And in this case, you know, the profits are going up. So it, it reminds me of when he was vice president uh, and Obama was president, they would give speeches on a regular basis about how rotten Wall Street was and just condemning them right and left. And yet uh, they were making a fortune for their friends on Wall Street. It was as if there was a wink and a nod. I'm going to badmouth you, but you're going to make an awful lot of money. Uh, we'll see to that. Well, the problem is, as anybody that talks to their constituents knows, and I know that includes my friend from Michigan, um, they're hurting. And for us to have a hearing like this today that seems to them to be completely oblivious to the kind of hurt that they're going through, it, it is just psychologically devastating to them. It's like nobody is listening to them. Uh, we say we're listening, but then if they turn on C-SPAN and see this markup, and see that there is not one thing we're going to do today that is going to help them with what in their lives is a crisis. You know, we're back, I'm back to hearing things from constituents that I heard during the Obama administration where people complaining, uh, you know, single moms, I, I'm maxing out my credit cards just getting gasoline so that I can get to and from work because I can't afford to live in the city. I have to have a cheaper place to live. And now that I'm maxing out my credit card on gas and gas keeps going up, I, I may not be able to buy gas just to get to and from work and then I'll be out of work. I mean, people are getting frantic as they see these prices. They've gone higher than they've ever been. And it's time that we actually did something about it because we can. So while our fearless leader is flying to Saudi Arabia and begging OPEC on hands and knees, um, you know, please, please give us more oil and gas. As my friend from Louisiana points out, and he mentioned Permian, but it's a whole lot shorter to fly to the Permian Basin and say, we need to ramp up production. What, what do I need to do? Or flying to the Dakotas or, or places where we actually can ramp up production if this administration will just get out of the way and stop making it more difficult. Um, and by the way, natural gas looks like uh, nine... 29, um, that's, that's getting really expensive. And one lady told me during the Obama administration, she said, I'm in my 80s and the price of energy is getting so high, I'm afraid I'm gonna end up dying in a home like I was born in, where the only source of energy or warmth was a wood burning stove. And I had to say, I'm sorry, this administration wants to take away your wood burning stove. Let's help people. And I support the amendment. Gentleman yields. Anyone else wish to be recognized on the amendment? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the gentleman from Louisiana for making this important point. And he's talked about the abundant resources that we have here in America and how we could be using those, yet we're focused today on a, on a cat bill, or that's the subject of the hearing. And I also want to thank the gentlelady from Michigan for speaking out and 
saying that this is a bipartisan issue, and that's exactly to our point. Why are we discussing uh, petting cats when America is concerned about energy? Uh, we should be having hearings about this because we all are concerned about it. It affects all of our constituents. The gentleman's bill also, or amendment also addresses not just energy, but minerals. And not only do we see President Biden going to Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, you know, asking our adversaries for oil, uh, we also saw this week where he removed restrictions so that more Chinese solar panels could uh, come into the United States. A devastating blow to domestic manufacturers of, of solar panels. So it seems like in every area that is involved in energy, we're trying to outsource it. We're trying to ship American wealth overseas, and it's hurting our constituents even more. So these are important issues that need to be addressed. And I think the gentleman's amendment is very appropriate that we shouldn't be doing anything in this committee uh, that's going to allow uh, OPEC or China or anybody else to profit uh, we should be addressing those issues uh, front and center and carrying out the business of the Committee of Natural Resources. And again, not, uh, not a Netflix documentary. I yield back, support the amendment. I, I yield to the gentleman from well, Texas. Because the gentleman from Louisiana was um, indicating, just in essence, that it's virtually insane to be pursuing the policies we are on energy and it depends on what your goal is. Um, it actually may be one of the most brilliant strategies of any administration in American history if the administration's goal is to help Iran, help Russia, help Saudi Arabia, help China, help Venezuela. It is absolutely a brilliant strategy because we are helping all of those countries. So it just depends on what the goal is, but it is not helping America. It is hurting us, it's devastating us, and we all see it with our constituents. I appreciate it. I yield back. Gentleman yields, anyone else wish to be recognized? Mr. Chair. So the all, all the way over on the corner, right side. But, oh, I'm sorry. So then I'll go back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've seen both at home and abroad, we're in a great battle, democracy versus authoritarianism. Here at home in January 6th, when so many of our colleagues stoked a violent insurrection, and across the world, including the war in Ukraine, which is one of the direct reasons for a world energy price increase. Sadly, nearly 50 of you sided with Putin in the recent vote to fund Ukraine against this terrible and unjustified invasion. And then we had a price gouging bill. I know a lot of you aren't in energy and commerce, so you weren't there for those hearings, but that was the single biggest vote we had. But you were there on the floor. How many voted no? Just about all of you in the biggest vote. I appreciate at least some people being honest in this debate that there are record profits being made by oil companies. And yet, at the time when we could do the biggest thing possible to help lower the price of the pump, you voted no. And it wasn't mentioned once, not once in any of your debates. And the Ukraine war wasn't even mentioned until about 20 minutes into this debate, or the fact that it's a world increase. And I applaud President Biden for using the strategic reserve. This was a key part of it. And then when Trump went to Saudi Arabia to help lower gas prices, there wasn't a peep from any of you. And now you're attacking President Biden. We're still the largest energy producer in the world. And we're not only helping Americans, but we're helping our brothers and sisters in Europe as they fight against a communist regime trying to take them over and murder their people. One of the biggest drivers is the Trump tariffs, which we're literally just applauded right now. That is one of the major drivers of inflation right now. And the president just rolled back several of them related to solar panels, which we all agree we need to have. And then immigration reform, another key driver of the labor shortage. We get no help from the other side on immigration reform. Small businesses throughout my district desperately need workers, yet we get no partners on the other side of the aisle for this. 
even though we passed several bills. And then the biggest issue I take issue with is to say we're doing nothing today to address the concerns of the American people. Uh, after a rash of mass shootings over these past three weeks, we're gonna have some votes on gun safety this week, and we're gonna have debates today. So to say that on this very day, we're not addressing the concerns of the American people says a lot about what you think about the priorities are in America, and I yield back. Mr. Rosendale, sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I really think that the, uh, my colleagues across the aisle need to understand the principles, basic principles of supply and demand, and that's what drives costs of energy up. Uh, the timeline that's necessary to develop these resources and the billions of dollars that it takes of, to invest in order to make sure that we do have an ample energy supply, which not only helps our people across the nation, but also contributes dramatically to our national security. And, and finally, who would have ever thought that the old adage, another day, another dollar, was going to be a reference to the gasoline prices across our nation, for Pete's sakes. It has now come back into vogue. With that, I would like to uh, yield some of my time to my good friend from Louisiana, because I think he had some additional uh, comments that he needed to address as far as those, those uh, resources. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosendale. Appreciate the, appreciate the yield. So, so let's, let's go through, Mr. Soto, some of the things that you brought up. First of all, I hate to get facts in the way of a good argument, but uh, there's not a single member on our side that's on the Energy and Commerce Committee, contrary to your, your, your comments uh, a minute ago. Number two, um, I, I, I was having a little trouble following your logic there, but I assume you were maybe talking about our vote no on the Federal Trade Commission bill that the, that the Democrats shoved through the House. I want to remind you that there are members of your party that similarly objected to that legislation. And here's why. They did that because in, in August of last year, August of last year, Brian Deese, who's a senior White House official, what is he, the director of economic policy, whatever, for the White House, he sent a letter to the Federal Trade Commission saying, hey, I want you to investigate price gouging of oil and gas companies. Let me, let me say that again. That was in, I think it was August of last year. Following, in November of last year, the President of the United States, you know, Joe Biden, he sent a letter to the Federal Trade Commission, which is generally what the presidents do. Presidents write letters to their subordinates. No, you do that only for press purposes. He sent a letter reiterating. Now, if the Federal Trade Commission actually needed authority to do the investigation, why in the hell did the boss write a letter telling him to do it? Because here's why, because all of this is a charade, because y'all are out there saying, hey, look, it's the Federal Trade Commission, they need to get involved, it's price gouging by big oil, oh no, this is Vladimir Putin's fault, it's Bigfoot, he did it. I mean, look, all of this, it, it, just out there, just chasing your tail, just coming up with false narratives, and as long as y'all continue to do that, we're gonna continue to see this number go up. It's gonna keep happening, because, because until you acknowledge the problem, then, then this is going to keep happening. Now, there was a comment that you made a minute ago saying that we sided with, with Vladimir Putin. And you said that a few of us, a handful of us, or dozens of us, whoever, voted against the Ukraine aid package. And, and you know what? I was one of those people, and you're damn right I did. And let me tell you why. Because in the Ukraine aid package, it provides funds for housing and transportation and medical care and clothing and all these things for, for folks in Ukraine. I've been to Ukraine. was there just a few months ago with Steny Hoyer. Visited with the refugees and everything else, and you know what? They deserve our help. But you know who else deserves our help? I don't know, Americans, how about that? We had one of the most powerful hurricanes in American history make landfall and hit my, my state, my constituents, people we represent. We tried to do an amendment to divert a portion of those funds to actually help out people at home that are homeless, that don't have a place to live, that don't have food. And you know what? Democrats rejected our amendment. So you know what? You're damn right I voted no, and I'd do it all day long because it was the wrong vote. I want to help the people in Ukraine, but I also want to make sure that we're helping people in Louisiana. I want to remind you that Democrats control the White House, the House, and the Senate. You control the agenda. You control the agenda. You want to talk about gun control and gun rights? You know what? You know the two bills having to do with gun safety and protecting our kids that have become law in the last, like, 10 years or 15 years, those would be Republican bills. The Fix Nicks, which has actually prevented people from getting guns that shouldn't have it and has saved lives. The, the, the bill that we did to help improve safety and security of schools to make sure that our kids can go there, as when I did, and be safe, when we didn't have fences, gates, locked doors, or anything else. So yeah, you're, you're right. 
You're right, we need to focus on those priorities, but one of the most pervasive things happening that's affecting every single American that's making them unable to make their ends meet is gas prices. And now what's coming is electricity prices and it's 100% unforced error. Last thing on this. A few of y'all brought up renewable energy. You know what? I fully support it. Fully support it. In fact, just a week or so ago, we had a hearing in this committee listening as to why we need to shut down the twin metals mine. You know what that is? It's cobalt, nickel, it's uh, copper, and platinum resources, 75 to 90% of the resources in the United States that's needed for renewable energy. This administration shuts it down. No to everything, no to all of the above, isn't an energy policy. Yield back. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield. Ms. Bovert, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all of the dialogue that's actually taking place today. This is very exciting. It's much better than um, just 100% Zoom, and, and people are actually inter interacting with one another. Um, this is exactly why I'm here. I saw our communities being regulated into poverty. Uh, Colorado's third district is full of natural resources. Our resources are rich and abundant, but politicians get into office and shut it down unnecessarily. Uh, the, the schools that were being built, the roads that were being built, the fire departments that were being built, the hospitals that were being built, all cease and are now overbuilt and they can't afford them because those tax revenues are not coming in. And of course, as we've heard time and time again today, every American is paying the price for these bad energy policies. Now, Many times here in this committee, we hear about our energy development being outsourced to our adversaries. This is very frustrating to me, knowing how clean our energy is, knowing that our guys produce it better than anyone. Uh, rather than begging OPEC, we should be relying on the American roughneck to produce this energy to reduce global emissions rather than outsourcing to China. Now, who is interested in the protection of China and the growth of China? Well, a lot of fingers would point to the White House right now because the Biden family has had strong ties with China. Look at the cobalt mines that China owns. We are outsourcing energy development. We are shutting down our coal-fired energy plants. In my district, one has been demolished. Another one is on its way to be shut down. Hundreds <laughs> of jobs will be lost in Craig, Colorado. China has promised to build some 200 coal-fired coal -fired energy plants and we buy solar panels from them. They own cobalt mines in the Congo. We've heard in this committee that there are some 40,000 children mining with their bare hands for that cobalt. So not in my backyard extremists can feel good about clean energy, ignoring the children. They're being used as slave labor that don't have tools to get the job done, that are going to work barefoot. And we're gonna say we did something virtuous because we have solar panels that we purchased from China. Hunter Biden's investment firm, Bohai Harvest, helped facilitate the sale to the Chinese of one of the world's largest cobalt mines in 2016. The Biden family has ensured that the renewable energy supply chain goes through China supply chains, which are replete with slave and child labor. I'm tired of the excuses that we need good, clean energy, and this is how we are producing it. Our energy is 42% cheaper than Russia's, and we can literally be exporting freedom to Europe right now. We can export our clean LNG to these other nations and liberate them from tyrants. You want to help Ukraine? Export our natural resources. Instead, we hear a push, hey, you can't afford gasoline, we'll buy a $50,000 electric vehicle. Well, those electric vehicles aren't powered by solar, they aren't powered by wind, they're powered by fossil fuels. It's very disingenuous, especially when we don't even talk about how productive nuclear energy could be right here in America. We have the opportunity to do something really great here. We have the opportunity to look at the problems that we are having with our energy production, with the high prices of gas, with, as we've heard, people putting gas on their credit cards, maxing out their credit cards. I have employees who are riding their bikes to work. Sure, maybe it's healthier, 
but it's not really convenient for them, but that's how they're able to save and make the money that they were making in this horrible time with inflation rising through this reckless spending that we are doing right here in Washington, D.C. We have an opportunity to solve this. And there are many, many crises that are taking place right here, right now in the United States that we have the ability to do something on. Instead, we, we vote on hair legislation. Don't demonstra demonstrate, or, uh, uh, do not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Praise the Lord. 14, <laughs> pretty close, Mr. Huffman. Do not discriminate, thank you. Um, I'll thank myself. So do not discriminate against this, the texture of someone's hair. This is something that we are talking about in Congress this year, rather than inflation, rather than supply chains, baby formula, energy, housing. And now, Mr. Huffman and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <laughs> Yields. Uh, let me uh, Mr. Chairman. recognize Mr. Huffman for a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and look, I just want to say uh, for those watching at home and for my fellow Democrats that are uh, suffering through this markup, uh, we have profound differences with our colleagues across the aisle on every one of these substantive points that have been made, points which have nothing to do with the legislation we are trying to get to a vote on today. We are being taken on any number of rhetorical detours into energy and drill baby drill and Russia and China and Hunter Biden. Um, there are rebuttals, there are rejoinders, there is another side to this entire story, but this is not the time to take the bait uh, and to lose sight of the fact that we have work to do in this committee. So I really wanna urge my fellow Democrats to not engage on detours. Uh, this is uh, about a specific piece of legislation, H.R. 263, well within the jurisdiction of this committee. We have other hearings on other bills where some of these subjects, you know, do become relevant. But this is not a time for detours. Uh, if these issues to my colleagues across the aisle are so darn important, you should want us to hurry up the actual business of this hearing so you can get back to that work. Uh, but say no to the detours, uh, don't take the bait, and let's try to get some work done today. I yield back. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Ms. McCollum? Mr. Yes, Chairman, I just want, all the subjects we're discussing, we all have care about a lot, but the agenda for the committee today matters a lot to the members that are bringing it forward and to the communities that they are from. There are Republicans that have bills here as well as Dems. We should not demean the importance of those bills that are being brought by members to their community. I, I, you're right, we shouldn't even delve into but I'm gonna tell you, I'm a capitalist. I believe in the free market system. I worked for General Motors for more than 30 years. My family was one of the founders of General Motors. So I believe in a free market system, but I know that free market systems can be abused at times too. But today we have people in their communities, places, that these issues deeply matter to. This committee has jurisdiction over those issues. Let's work together to help our colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, talk about issues that matter to their communities because that is also the work of this committee. General Lady Yields, anyone else wish to be recognized? Sir? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, to the point of why we're having this debate, it's because these issues are that Mr. Graves' amendment raises, extraordinarily important. And I want to share a little story. Last week, I went back to my district, which is one of the largest in, in Congress, and uh, went to one of my brother's horse sales. Uh, I had to drive 100 miles to get to it, had to drive 100 miles back, and that was a fraction of the distance across my district. Uh, the, I spoke to the young man running the service station at which I uh, pulled up to fill up. I said, what's the average cost of someone trying to fill up with diesel, their pickup truck? And he said between two and $400. And that's because my district is so large that you carry an extra tank. I said, what was the most? He said $800 for a double tank. Well, my folks out in my part of the world find this to be the most important issue. That's why I find the Graves Amendment so, so interesting. And, and I think it's absolutely worth the attention it's getting I wonder, as I was listening to other remarks, why we haven't had a hearing in this committee 
on the corporate activists that are preventing the financing of oil and gas drilling. Why, why haven't we had a hearing on that? Because it's certainly operating to prevent that type of investment. Why haven't we had a hearing on the closing down of pipelines and that impact, not necessarily right now, but in the future on, on fuel? Why aren't we having a hearing on the delays in permitting and the tools used by environmental organizations uh, to stop uh, permitting? Why, we hear about lots of, lots of things about permits, but not the delay. Why haven't we had a hearing on the impact uh, fuel prices, uh, uh, impact on fuel prices of these environmental clean fuel standards or cap and trade devices that were designed to drive up the cost of fuel, which, uh, by the way, has already happened. Why, why aren't those being uh, retired? Because they're certainly not necessary. And why aren't we having hearings on mining of in, uh, such things as copper, lithium, and, and cobalt? Because well, that sure isn't happening. Why aren't we having a hearing? on how the environmental organizations are driving up the cost to people. Why aren't we having those hearings? This, this, this committee should be having those hearings. I think that's the purpose uh, and of this digression, uh, diversion from, from, the, from the big cat bill, which, by the way, uh, is important. And I'll mention this again when I get to my amendment. Uh, 35 states already have addressed the big cat issue. 35 states. There are 15 that haven't, and I suppose that was, is what the bill is focused on. But guess what? There are so many more important issues all of which, or some of which I've just mentioned, with that I yield to Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Benz, appreciate the, appreciate the time. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Soto, once again, he, he mentioned this, this FTC price gouging. I wanna remind members that the Secretary of Energy that was appointed by President Biden actually testified before the House, and she said there that, the, that price gouging was not an issue and it hadn't been found. And I remind you, after the letters, nine months now, um, out there doing investigations, chasing tails on this one, and, and no one has found that there's, that there's price gouging. Mr. Benz talked about, about permit delays. I was recently in the Permian Basin, spent time in Texas and in New Mexico. Um, let, let's talk about permit delays a little bit. I said a minute ago that we have a higher percentage of APDs or, or drilling permits that are actually under production now than ever before. Why aren't those remaining permits uh, being drilled right now, those areas being produced? And there's a reason for that. The reason is, is that there are things that there are other permits that are required in order for these leases to be produced. And the administration in many cases is not granting those other permits. Secondly, you have things like litigation that is holding up or preventing these areas from being able to be produced. Let me give you a couple of statistics. New Mexico, again, I was just in Hobbs, New Mexico. In 2020, on average, it took 400 days. It took 400 days in 2020 to issue a permit, BLM land to issue a permit for, for energy production. In the latest quarter, it's taken 650 days. There has been a 50% reduction in the number of permits that have been issued. I mean, Mr. Chairman, th th there's not a leg to stand on it, to watch y'all continue to try to hold these positions whenever it is your policies that have caused the problems that we're facing today. What am I talking about? Let me give you some examples. Build Back Better Act, this committee right here, you voted to raise royalty rates, I believe it was 50%. What that means is to increase the cost of domestic energy production. Where does that money come from? Does it come from the money tree? Does it come from somebody winning the lottery? No, it comes from consumers. It, we pay more at the gas pump. Y'all tried to employ a $10,000 a mile a year pipeline fee. Where does the money come from? If you're a company and you're planning, you're out your uh, cost and your, and your investments and your, and your prices, you build that in. All of these were unforced errors. I'll say it again. You own the White House, the House, and the Senate. You own these decisions. The, the, impact, the impact on our, on our constituents. These are, this is what happens. Bad policy results in this. Gentlemen's time has expired. Anyone else? Mr. Uh, Chairman. I think uh, Ms. McCollum, you you sought to be recognized? Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. Chair, I was just trying to figure out what the order of business is, and I be believe that we need to proceed to get to the business done so that we can carry on this debate in other committees. Thank you. Anyone else wish to be recognized, sir? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Oh. Oh. Mr. Chairman. At, uh, Mr. Son, is that San Nicholas? 
Sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear I'm me going, okay? I'm alternating, and I'm sorry. And as soon as this gentleman is over, Ms. Uh, Mr. San Nicolas will turn to you, sir. Sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, this is not a debate I was expecting to have this morning. Uh, personally, I'm glad we're having the debate this morning. Because if you ask the average American what's front of mind for them, they will absolutely say inflation and the cost of energy. I think we all have heard this every single day. I personally get calls from my constituents talking about how much is, this is hurting them. Uh, I think it's important to focus on the big picture here. You know, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to focus on the fact that this is not a partisan issue. It should, should not be a partisan issue, right? We all care about our constituents. We care about energy prices. Uh, we all care about the environment. We all believe that we need to transition to cleaner forms of energy. We all believe that we have a responsibility to help make our earth a greener place. The problem is that the way this transition is being managed is completely nonsensical. So a couple of days ago, I was in Hobbs, New Mexico with Congressman Graves, uh, Congressman Her Congresswoman Harrell, uh, meeting with energy executives. Uh, we toured some production uh, sites, trying to figure out what the constraints were that were driving energy prices in America. Last night, I met with a group of energy executives, the US Energy Stream that had a dinner here in Washington, DC. A number of us are going back over there this afternoon to speak with that group. Here's what they're telling us. No one asked them about what they needed to increase production. No one asked them what was going to happen to energy prices. So the problem is we've got this idea that we in government can just wave our hands, pass legislation, and force this transition into green energy. And the problem is that we are just not ready for that right now. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the solar panels. We don't have the battery storage that we're gonna need. We're shutting down clean energy sources like nuclear power plants that are basically the cleanest energy that mankind knows how to produce. So when we ignore this advice, you know, this is what occurs. And I also think it's important to focus on the big picture here because the US accounts for what, 13% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions, depending on how you figure, it's around 13%. So this is a worldwide discussion that we're having because a ton of carbon does not care if it's emitted here in the United States or over in China or in Russia, right? So to get this worldwide problem under control, it needs to have worldwide solutions. And anything that we do here in the United States is just scribbling in the margins if we don't consider the impacts on, on the worldwide problem. Uh, here's a statistic that should alarm everybody. It doesn't matter what we do here in the US because developing countries are gonna drive this discussion. So we account for 13% of uh, global gas, worldwide carbon emissions. Uh, India, developing country, they care about the environment too, but guess what they care more about? The amount of poverty in their country and lifting that country out of poverty as, uh, as they industrialize. If India, increases their per capita energy consumption only to the level of Japan, which has basically got the lowest of any industrialized country, that will have the effect of increasing global carbon emissions by over 25%. In other words, about twice the total amount that we do here in the United States. So the only way to solve this global problem is for us to focus on countries like India, emerging countries, and to, to be able to use American ingenuity and innovation to help them solve the energy problems that they're gonna have so they don't end up building more coal-powered uh, uh, power plants. That is the only way. And we've got the tools to do that here. We're, we've got uh, investments in, uh, in our next generation nuclear or modular nuclear reactors. We're, uh, we, we had the first uh, uh, fission ignition ever, I'm sorry, fusion ignition ever here, uh, here in a national laboratory here in the United States. So. Those are the things that are going to catalyze global solutions to this problem. All the stuff that we are arguing about, about curtailing fossil fuel production and not renewing leases on, uh, uh, on public lands here in the United States, none of that in a global sense is gonna matter. So I mean, that brings us back to what we're talking about today, which is that we are hurting the people we are here to represent when we take these actions that raise their energy prices. And ironically, and I'll close with this, ironically, the people that we hurt the most, the people that pay the highest price for those energy, uh, the, the energy prices and, and the price of fuel right now, are the people in the US that can least afford to pay it. Those are the people that we all say that we care the most about. 
But those are the people that are really hurting. I hear from them every day, I know you do too. And that's why we think that this is such an opportune time to have this discussion. So, you know, I apologize if, if we're delaying the hearing, but uh, it's a conversation that has to be had. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. San Nicolas, pardon me for the delay, sir, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just first wanted to inquire with the chair if he would be so gracious. We are on HR 263, correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we are. And HR 263 is the big cat bill. Is that right, Mr. Chairman? Correct again. And we are on amendment number three from Mr. Graves, Mr. Chairman? Three for three. So I just wanted to, for the benefit of the American people who are watching this hearing, read what Amendment 3 actually says. It says, no provision of this act shall take effect if determined to result in an increased reliance on hostile foreign nations such as Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, or any organization of petroleum exporting countries, OPEC, member nations to meet US energy needs, including critical minerals, and rare earth elements as defined by the US Geological Survey. Mr. Chairman, if the prime sponsor of HR 263 would be so generous to you, and I'd like to ask Mr. Huffman, is there anything specifically in the big cat bill that's going to result in an increased reliance on hostile foreign nations? Uh, not a thing, no. Mr. San Nicolas, nor would this amendment do anything to address the inflation, gas prices, China, Hunter Biden laptop, or other uh, issues that we've heard all about in the performances so far today. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Huffman. I actually wanted to, if the gentleman would so yield, uh, pose that question to, to Mr. Graves. I wanted to ask him specifically, how much does he expect this amendment to lower gas prices? Because there's been, there's been a very passionate argument about the gas price issue on the big cat bill. And I'm curious how his specific amendment, how much does he expect this to lower gas prices if the gentleman will so yield? Yeah, he yielded. Man, you're all right. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. San Nicholas. So, San, Mr. San Nicholas, uh, the, the Democrats control the agenda of this committee. The amendment's intent is to actually try to focus the agenda of this committee on the jurisdiction that is of the highest priority of the American people. Um, look, your constituents, I guarantee you, I'd be willing to take a bet right now. They haven't, all, they haven't time, said we Mr. want you to address big cats. They've said General they want you to address prices. Gentleman reclaims his time. Mr. Chairman, the question is very specific if the gentleman still would like to yield. How much does he expect his amendment to lower gas prices in the big cap bill when the amendment reads no provision of this act shall take effect if it will result in an increased reliance on hostile foreign nations and the prime sponsor made it very plain that this bill doesn't do any of that then how does this this amendment specifically how much is he expecting this amendment to reduce gas prices in a big cap bill? does he have a, an amount or are we just going to have a whole another narrative Thank you, Mr. San Nicholas. I appreciate the yield. Uh, Mr. San Nicholas, how many constituents at town hall meetings have asked you to address big cats and how many have told you that they want you to address energy prices? We're trying to help Mr. you Chairman, focus time, this committee's Chairman, agenda in our jurisdiction time, on gentlemen. the priorities Chairman, of the American people. You're talking about big cats right now. I can't even believe you're doing this. Chairman, you're talking about time. big cats. Mr. Graves, the gentleman reclaimed his time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Yeah, you heard it. Uh, th th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I just wanted to make it plain to the American people First and foremost, I think that my colleagues on, on the Democratic side of the aisle have been very gracious calling for all of us to work together. I think that that's something that we need to do. I think Mr. Huffman has been very gracious in, in calling for us to address the issue at hand. And I think that the points that have been made on both sides of the aisle are definitely points for all of us to consider and that the American people will agree to that. But let's be upfront with the American people that voting yes on this amendment will do nothing for gas prices. Voting no on this amendment will do nothing for gas prices. And this amendment has nothing to do with foreign nations because big cats have nothing to do with our reliance on foreign nations. So I think that the, the dialogue is, is very passionate. I think it's very relevant uh, in terms of what the American people are going through. But the actual, the actual amendment itself will do nothing for the issue at hand. So let's, let's move on. 
And let's just be upfront with the American people as we continue to entertain the remainder of these amendments as to whether or not it's actually going to accomplish the purposes that are intended in the opening narratives of these amendments, because this does nothing for gas prices. I mean, the mover of the amendment uh, can't give us a, a firm answer on whether or not the, the dollar amount is going to change. It's very plain that it won't. So I'd like to uh, uh, echo the, the sentiments of Mr. Huffman. Let's address the big cat legislation. If you don't like it, vote no. But let's not introduce amendments to make it seem like there's going to be a solution for the American people in here when there is none. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman Yields, anyone else wish to be recognized on uh, Graves number three? Here we no further debate. The question is on Graves Amendment number three. I will pause so members uh, can unmute. Those in favor of Graves number three, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed to Graves number three, Please indicate by saying no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no has have it. The no has have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Graves. Uh, request a recorded vote. The recorded vote has been requested. This vote will be postponed uh, until prior announcement. Uh, Representative Graves, you have amendment number four. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman. There was conversation earlier about, about the, again, the, the 9,000 permits and, and, and the impact that this is having. Um, Mr. Chairman, there, there's something called a, a letter of authorization that National Marine Fisheries Service has to grant in order for uh, energy producers in the offshore to, to, to be able to actually produce energy or to be able to do seismic surveys and things along those lines. These, these normally just take a few weeks. but. National Marine Fisheries Service has delayed these things exponentially. And as a matter of fact, um, they, they recently came out, or I say recently in February, they came out and acknowledged that, quote, erroneous estimates resulted in miscalculated projections in the impact of activities in the Gulf of Mexico involving rarely sighted species. Let me give you an example. Maybe it was like um, this activity is going to impact walrus or uh, maybe, maybe polar bears that, that you may be shocked to learn we actually don't have in the, in the Gulf. And so it's another example of this administration, their mistakes that are, that are causing an impact and are delaying production of energy. This is, this is why they're, they're, even though we're at the highest percentage of permits that have, uh, that, that have ever been produced, that's why we're in this situation that, that we're in right now. So, so we, do have, we do have an amendment. Amendment number four says that the bill cannot act, uh, restrict access to critical minerals on federal land or increase reliance on foreign nations with human rights issues. Mr. Chairman, the reason we've proposed this amendment, let me be clear, we fully support, we fully support increased deployment of renewable energy, which needs to include solar and wind, it needs to include wave and geothermal, it needs to include hydro, it needs to include nuclear energy, including SMRs and next-gen nuclear. And it needs to include oil and gas because the Biden administration's own projections indicate that there's going to be a surge in oil and gas demand globally. Like I said, developing countries, nearly an 80% increase in demand moving forward. And so rather than doing what this administration is doing, where they're shutting down the twin metals mine, shutting down the resources we need to deploy renewable energy, in the United States, rather than what the, this administration's doing, we're just, what was that, yesterday or day before, the Biden administration comes out and says that we are actually going to eliminate tariffs for solar panels that are being transshipped from China. China right now manufactures 90% of the solar panels that are being sold around the world, 90%. You know what? We want solar energy too, where it makes sense, when it's economically sustainable and it's environmentally sustainable. This administration is not just going to other countries for oil and gas, they're going to other countries for renewable energy sources too, whether it's the critical minerals and the rare earths or it's actually the production of things like wind turbines or things like solar panels. You can't make this stuff up. If we didn't learn our lesson that this administration committed to triple our dependence on Russian oil, now we're going to go and say, hey, we're going to get all of our solar panels from China? Which, which juveniles are running this place? This is crazy. 
We're going to go from one authoritarian regime to the other, and we're going to be dependent upon them and give them leverage over our economy and our national security. This isn't funny. This is serious stuff, and it's incredibly dangerous. Look, I make mistakes all the time, but I try to go back and acknowledge them and fix them. This administration keeps doubling and tripling down on the stupid decisions that have got us in this situation. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually say something that, that I don't think I've ever said before and I, I hope I never say again. Let's, in, let's take this moment. In, okay, In Thank this you. instance, I actually think I agree with Senator Schumer, Senator Markey, Senator Cantwell, and Senator Menendez. Let me explain. In a letter that they sent a while back, they said the current run-up in world energy prices is effectively a tax on every American family's discretionary budget, except that the money goes to the OPEC cartel rather than the U.S. Treasury. Let me say it again. It's pretty rare that I actually agree with those senators, Senator Schumer, Senator Markey, Senator Cantwell, and Senator Menendez, but you know what? They got it right. This is a tax on the American people and the profits are going to OPEC. They're not coming to the U.S. Treasury because this administration is blocking domestic energy production. I urge adoption of the amendment and yield back. Uh, I'm gonna uh, recognize Ms. McCollum for a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are some important items on this agenda. One of the most important is establishing a Truth and Healing Commission for the way Native American children and their families were attacked by the federal government in the past, causing death, causing intergenerational trauma, and it was a, it was a way for us to move forward with healing. There's also other bills on here dealing with uh, Native American issues. One of our jurisdictional issues is dealing with the, tr with the tribes in a fair and equitable way. We carry these bills on behalf of these tribal nations, and um, they have been listening to this debate being hijacked by um, things that I think we all do agree on that we need to address gas prices, but it's been hijacked now to the point where it is a Republican campaign committee for the next election. Mr. Chair, I'm very disappointed in that, and I know you have something to say. I yield back. Thank you, uh, and uh, I, I'll, I'll admit that uh, I was remiss. I thought that uh, the agenda we had today uh, that had been discussed with the minority, uh, and there were five bills that were regular order, uh, that the items before us were not trivial, that each one had substance, and each one represented a constituency of a given member uh, that felt that the, these legis this legislation was important and necessary. But, you know, uh, crisis acting is dominating uh, the day today. And, uh, and, and strategic uh, messaging is dominating the day. And I didn't, uh, I nor the majority in the committee uh, came to do our regular order, finish these bills, move them forward if possible, uh, because they've been through hearings and they've been through regular order. And that there's an expectation. There are some bills that have been waiting two sessions to be heard and to be dealt with. But we'll return on Wednesday. And the reason I say that is in, in anticipation of further crisis acting, uh, we'll be better prepared. And better prepared to move this agenda, to get it done, so uh, I'm adjourning this meeting and we'll reconvene Wednesday, 10 o'clock, same time, same place. Thank you.